So shall we get started? Hi, good afternoon. My name is Marta Filizola. I'm the Dean of the School of Biomedical Sciences at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. I'm very happy to be able to welcome all of you to the 2022 lab coat ceremony for PhD students. This marks our fifth annual ceremony with our biomedical sciences and neuroscience students. And this year, we are pleased to be able to present the lab coats to the students in our clinical research program as well. We hold this ceremony to mark the start of our students' journey in academic research and training. The lab coats we present to them are a symbol of the professionalism and authority which trainees develop and foster during their time in our programs. Biomedical and research in clinical research help us solve problems and find solutions based on data and observation. We continue to see this unfold and our search for solutions expand as we delve into new areas of research such as our new training area in artificial intelligence and emerging technologies in medicine. We look to our students to help us continue our growth into frontiers and directions in translational research. We are excited to have so many people join us today both in person and virtually to celebrate with our first year doctoral students across our biomedical sciences and neuroscience and clinical research programs and help us mark the start of their academic research training. It's now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Eric Nestler, Dean of Academic and Scientific Affairs, Director of the Friedman Brain Institute, Nash Family Professor of the Fishberg Department of Neuroscience. Dr. Nestler, please come forward. Thank you, Dean Filizola. It is a great honor to welcome our first year PhD students and their families to this lab code ceremony. This year, we have a record number of entering students in biomedical sciences and neuroscience and clinical research. We remain one of the very few graduate schools in the country to have a lab code ceremony, but we do so because of the increasing scrutiny placed on the nation's biomedical research enterprise and the unique responsibility that each of you will take on once you complete your training. After a very difficult two and a half years wrought by the COVID-19 pandemic and related economic, social, and political turmoil, I am confident that we are now firmly in the post-pandemic era. 
COVID-19 will, of course, remain with us just as influenza re remains with us 100 years after its pandemic, but we can now get back to normal life, in-person classes, scientific conferences, and social discourse. It's been quite a challenge for all of us, but I'm heartened by where we find ourselves today. In this spirit, I'd like to share some advice with you as you embark on your graduate education. I received some awful advice 45 years ago when I started my PhD, and yes, I am that old. Many people told me something like, you are gonna have to work so hard that there will be no time for fun, no social life, get used to it. This was awful advice because number one, it was dead wrong, and number two, what a demoralizing thing to tell young people. Much better advice, which I followed when I was a student and have encouraged all of my students to follow is work hard and play hard. Getting a PhD is hard work. There's no way around that. If it weren't hard, everybody could do it and it wouldn't mean that much to accomplish. It's hard work because PhDs, unlike all professional degrees, for example, an MD or law degree, require each of us to create a body of knowledge that is new for the world. By contrast, all professional degrees simply require learning a trade in a set period of time with no original discoveries required. And creating new knowledge is difficult. Some of you will have to develop a new experimental approach, for example, as I had to do for my PhD. I spent the entire first year of my lab work trying to develop a new laboratory method and had literally zero positive results to show for it. One year, zero positive data. Those were very dark, scary days for me because when experiments don't work, when you're a PhD student, one's path toward a PhD can seem infinite, unattainable. It's not just putting in the time. Yet I had very strong support from my PI who felt confident that I was not wasting my time, that I was making steady, albeit slow progress, and that I should stay the course. He was right. I went on to complete my PhD in a normal amount of time and had several high profile papers. I hope that most of you can avoid such a dry spell in the lab, but I will say that by living through those frustrating months, I learned the importance of perseverance and I gained the confidence to press on years later in my own lab when scientific progress inevitably ebbs and flows. At the same time, life must go on. No one should ever defer having a social life during PhD studies. We want you all to get together with friends, date, go to concerts and theater, exercise, and so on. We expect some of you will get married during your PhDs. Some of you may have children. And by the way, work-life balance, as we say these days, was just as important to me when I was a graduate student as it should be for all of you and I ended up doing all right for myself. Enjoy yourselves and have fun during these PhD years while working and living in the best city in the world. Among the most important features you should learn from your PhD beyond perseverance are independence and initiative. To make most of your time at Mount Sinai and well beyond in your future careers, go out and get what you need. Don't sit back and wait passively for others to bring things to you. Most of our faculty will be very responsive when you seek them out, and if you let Marta and me know, if those who aren't, we'll give them a nudge. All of Mount Sinai is at your fingertips. This is one of the very best most innovative, most entrepreneurial medical centers in the nation, which offers tremendous resources as you get your burgeoning careers underway and decide which of many available professional paths, whether academic, industry, government, journalism, among others, you take in the future. 
choose your lab carefully. Get your cells into labs that enable you to reach your potential and make your labs, your lives productive and happy. Choose a PI who will provide the scientific guidance and emotional support that I received from my PI years ago. Meanwhile, we're embarking this year on a new mentoring the mentor program so that over the next year, possibly two, every single PI at Mount Sinai who supervises a graduate student or postdoc will take a full course on how to be the best mentor possible. You'll hear more about this new program over the coming months. Finally, as if working hard and playing hard doesn't give you enough to do, consider volunteering. This is something that your generation is doing far, far better than my generation ever contemplated. Very few of us did anything beyond our own noses when we were your age, yet your generation has inspired me by your commitment to others. You can volunteer, for example, in the East Harlem Health Outreach Partnership, or EHOP, and assist those in our community without health insurance. You can work for any of many student groups on campus. I'll just mention one focused on my own area of interest, neuroscience, called MINDS, Mentoring in Neuroscience Discovery at Sinai, where PhD students go to local public schools and teach elementary, middle, and high school students about the brain and host students in our own Mount Sinai labs to really turn them on to our exciting field. Those of you who are interested in these kinds of activities will have time to give back and we will support you in doing so. I've had a lab for 35 years now and I have always considered myself among the luckiest guys alive because every day I go to work to mentor young people like yourselves and pursue science, my life's passion. I hope that each and every one of you use your PhDs for an equally rewarding and exciting career. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Messler. I would also like to recognize and thank our alumni supporters who contributed to making this year this very special ceremony possible. Our deep appreciation also goes to the Mount Sinai Alumni Association for the sponsoring the lab coats our students are about to receive. I invite Dr. Alexis Colvin, Associate Dean for Alumni Affairs, to join us in full. Dr. Colvin. Congratulations on not just starting graduate school, but joining a family of incredible alumni. I hope you take advantage of all of the opportunities to learn from them. For instance, meet your future mentor through our Alumni Connect Mentorship Program, which pairs alums with current graduate students. There are also weekly virtual Alumni Connect small group meetings in which you will get to meet with a diverse range of alums to discuss career paths and benefit from the wisdom of their experience. These sessions are truly invaluable. Before I close, I just want to say how honored I am to be able to welcome you at the beginning of your Icon School of Medicine journey and to let you know that I will also be here at the end to welcome you into our alumni community. Congratulations again and best of luck. Big thank you of our, to our alumni community as well as to Dr. Colvin. I would now like to invite Dr. Nestler back to the podium to introduce our keynote speaker. Dr. Nessler, please come forward. I am delighted and especially proud to have one of our very own, Xiao Si Gu, be our keynote speaker today. Dr. Gu is an associate professor of psychiatry and neuroscience and founding director of the Center for Computational Psychiatry at Mount Sinai and she is one of the foremost researchers in this very exciting new field. After receiving a dual degree in economics and psychology from Peking University in Beijing, Dr. Gu received her PhD in neuroscience here at Mount Sinai, completing her thesis under the mentorship of Dr. Patrick Hoff before pursuing her postdoctoral training at Virginia Tech in the Wellcome Center for Neuroimaging 
at University College London. Dr. Gu's research focuses on examining the neural and computational mechanisms underlying human decision-making and social interaction in both health and disease. She synthesizes the fields of neuroscience and behavioral economics. Her lab has also recently started to use intracranial recording techniques to measure electrical and chemical substrates of higher order cognition in humans undergoing neurosurgical procedures. Please join me in welcoming our very own alumna and faculty, Xiao Sigu. Wow, what an honor. Thank you so much, uh, Eric, and also um, everyone on the grad school leadership for inviting me. It's really an honor to be here today. And now that you know the context, you know how, how close to heart this audience and this occasion is to me. Exactly 15 years ago, I arrived in New York City, actually to Aaron Hall specifically, <laughs> with just two suitcases. I still remember that day really clearly. It was a Sunday, uh, Sunday night actually. It was rainy and dark, right? So having no clue what I have got myself into moving across the uh, Pacific Ocean, I was so tired, I was completely drenched and I was very hungry. So, but I was only to find out that the only restaurant that was still open was a, a Chinese takeout place. Can you guess what the name of that restaurant is? <laughs> it's the famous or the infamous, should I say, Yao Ming Garden. <laughs> that is still surprisingly in business. <laughs> so adding to my misery, I had to shovel down this greasy fake Chinese food down my throat. Uh, it did the purpose, right? <laughs> so if you had caught me at that exact moment and asked me, how do you think your life is going to turn out, right? Not in my wildest dream would I tell you that, oh, I think I'm going to be a professor here at Sinai, or I would be standing here, you know, delivering this speech, very special speech to all of you here 15 years later. No way, right? Not a single chance. So, so the point of sharing this story with you here today is you really never know where life takes you. Um, today, we're really gathered here to celebrate you, celebrate the beginning of a brand new journey with all of you. This journey might be difficult, right? This journey could potentially be rewarding. This journey might change your life but it is a journey that is guaranteed to be uncertain. So you might ask, what is the secret ingredient for us to survive this journey, right? Maybe even better, how do we make the process actually enjoyable and even successful? There are many answers to this question. You know, some were mentioned in Eric's speech earlier, you know, resilience, perseverance, dedication, maybe enthusiasm. But there's one ingredient I really want to talk about today, and it's something that I think uh, is almost forgotten in recent years in uh, science, and something that I still have to constantly remind myself of, and that's cur curiosity. Um, I think curiosity is the fundamental reason you're all sitting here today, instead of you know working a very nice job in Wall Street <laughs> or Silicon Valley, um, just like all of your college friends are probably doing at this moment, right? Actually, some of you might ha have already worked and decided to come back to grad school. And you, you've got to ask yourself why, right? I think that here I want to share another personal story with you. Um, so actually, I have, as if you know me personally, you probably know, I have always been a very curious person. So even after my PhD, where I did relatively well and could just go on with this academic trajectory, 
uh, without much uncertainty or surprise, I decided I'm gonna try out some non-academic options, okay? So I applied for a bunch of things and I actually ended up being accepted into a very prestigious program uh, with a major business consulting company. So it was not a you know, long-term contract, but that's a way for these companies to sort of uh, attract you know, future hires and potential talent. So I was putting through this boot camp. They flew us to the Alps and we stayed at a very nice castle for a couple of days. <laughs> And to go through these actually interesting simulations of what real consulting projects look like, right? And not long after I landed in that amazing castle, I decided that this is not for me, okay? I really cannot pretend that I'm interested in a fake sort of business scenario, right? A project that is really designed to serve a very specific purpose of a business. Right. So despite the fact that, you know, uh, of course, uh, job scenario and salary and a lot of other things seemed attractive, I was really, really bored out of my mind for that week. And uh, similarly with my other explorations outside of academia, I've decided that nothing really trades for that intellectual freedom and nothing else can really satisfy my intellectual curiosity other than being a scientist. So what should we be curious about, right? Is it everything in life? Today, I think I'll just list three main types of curiosity uh, as a starting point. And that is, first, be curious about science, your scientific topic, be curious about people, and finally, be curious about life itself. Be curious about science. Just like choosing a life partner, there are many reasons why you want to choose a lab today, right? And actually, thanks to all the conversations we're having in academia, many people realize that lab culture is very important. I think the PI's mentoring style is very important. But let's not forget that the scientific topic itself is really important as well. You must be curious about the research project. Because think about this, science is hard and it's slow sometimes. And this is something that you will spend at least the next five or six years to work on or potentially for the rest of your career, right? And it's actually not really cheesy to do what you love uh, for, for a living, right? And in fact, I think that's the only way to do it you really must love what you do because that carries you through the difficult times in your PhD. Second, be curious about people. A huge reason why I feel pumped every day to go to work is because of the people uh, that I work with, to be honest. Face-to-face -face meetings, grabbing lunch together, or even just bumping into people, right? Having a small talk in the hallway. These are what I call the daily doses of happiness that really carry, carry you through the day. Because again, science can be slow and can be frustrating mm -hmm. and many other aspects uh, are really all about delayed gratification. This is also exactly why the past two years have been extremely difficult because we were you know, deprived of that. Now that things are mostly back to normal, it, it's really time to re-emphasize this fun part and bring that back into our PhD lives. And thankfully, we have a really great and vibrant community here. There are so many social events beyond the scientific ones. I really do encourage you to you know, get yourself out there and try to participate in these events as much as possible. Really embrace your lab mates, your roommates, and your colleagues. Right. Don't be shy about asking people out for coffee, for lunch. Seek advice. And very importantly, find what I call your people. Right. Um, they can be anyone. Again, science scientists or non-scientists. I can't tell you how many times it is these late night discussions with people 
and three hour long phone calls that carried me through some of the most difficult times of my own scientific journey. And I think that's also true for a lot of this, you know, people I've heard about. Finally, let's be curious about life itself. And this, I think it's really the holy grail of curiosity. I think what we do, biomedical sciences, are fundamentally about humans, right? We want to address human-centered issues. In fact, I think the best science is really driven by and must be grounded in human reality. It also follows that we as scientists actually have an obligation to stay curious about the world itself and pursue work that can really meet human needs. Living in New York City is really great for that because all aspects of humanity are right in your face. So let me give you another example. My office now is located in central Harlem on 125th Street. So every day walking in these Harlem streets has become a routine exercise of field research for myself. Because trust me, the way you think really changes when you witness how homelessness is so strongly related to mental illness and drug use. And when, po when you see how poverty uh, strongly leads to desperation and aggression and how lack of schooling and parenting might leave kids in the streets, right? These are, I'm not making these up, right? Because these are the things I see every day uh, just on my walk from the sixth train station to the office. This has really made me rethink some of the research questions that we're pursuing. And I think having these curiosity as well as empathy driven um, observations and thinking really allow you to see your own work, its impact from a much higher level beyond just the publications and grants. It makes you a better scientist. Okay, I hope you really find some use in what I shared with you today, right? I'm trying to try really hard to, to come up with stories and I think brief take home messages that could be of some help to you all. And I just wanna conclude by saying that please let curiosity lead the way lead you to become not only a better scientist, but a better human being. The world has changed. The boundary between science and industry, between different research disciplines or different nations and cultures is increasingly blurry. I think all of you are going to be, and actually you are already, the next generation innovators. You are going to be the next generation of scientists maybe policymakers, and maybe entrepreneurs. However you decide to exert your impact, stay curious about humanity and stay curious about the solutions to human issues might be the only way to truly unlock your actual potential and your secret power and eventually find your path. I want to end by sharing a quote from of course, the greatest scientist of all time, Albert Einstein. The important thing is not to stop questioning. Curiosity is, has its own reason for existence. One cannot help but in awe when he contemplates the mysteries of eternity, of life, of the marvelous structure of reality. It is enough if one tries merely to comprehend a little of this mystery each day. Thank you. Dr. Do, no, this was very, very nice. Thank you very much. And I hope your words today serve as an inspiration to our students and help guide them as they embark on their academic research journey. The next part, 
of the ceremony. Now, this is the part many of you have been uh, awaiting will be the presentation of 2022 matriculating a PhD and MD PhD students with lab coats as a symbolic induction into their rigorous uh, academic uh, scientific training. Students will receive their lab coats from distinguished members of the graduate school faculty who exemplify outstanding graduate teaching and mentoring. It is my pleasure to introduce some of our distinguished directors of our multidisciplinary training areas who will be alternating in quoting the 2022 matriculating PhD and MD PhD classes in biomedical sciences and neuroscience. Please stand as I call your name. Dr. Betsy Cropper, faculty from our neuroscience program. Dr. Alan Seifert, co-director of the artificial intelligence and emerging technologies in medicine. Dr. Doris Germain, co-director of the cancer biology MTA. Dr. Robert Krauss and Florence Mauro, co-directors of the development, regeneration and stem cells MTAs. Dr. Anne Vokok and Benjamin Hopkins, co-directors of the genetics and genomics sciences MTA. Dr. Lucas Ferrari de Andrade and Amir Horowitz, faculty from our immunology program, Dr. Domenico Tostorella and Dr. Jean Lim, co-directors of the microbiology training area, and Dr. Avner Schlesinger and Eric Sobi, co-directors of the pharmacology and therapeutics discovery training area. It's also my pleasure to introduce this year's roster reader for our doctoral students, Dr. Matthew O'Connell, Senior Associate Dean for PhD programs in the Graduate School of Biomedical Sciences and Professor of Oncological Sciences. Connell, please come forward. Wow. I deserve it. Um, thank you, Martha, uh, Dean Filizola. Um, I'd like to welcome everybody here, the students in the front of the room and the friends and family in the back. Also acknowledge everything you did to get these guys to where they are um, today. Um, it'll be my uh, honor uh, to be a part of this special ceremony. I'll, the students will come up in groups of four um, or sometimes three. Please hold off on your applause until they each have their coat um, and then there'll be a a spot to um, take a picture. So it's now my pleasure to call up the uh, 2022 matriculants, uh, matriculating PhD students in both biomedical science and neuroscience programs. Okay, so away we go. Our first group, Alejandro Abraham, Jesus Ayala, Bo Bars, and Eva Bednarski. All right. See, now all you guys know what to do. We've had a dress rehearsal. Okay. All right. Group two. Uh, Abhijit uh, Biji, Hannah Bright, uh, Jamie Carty, and Lynn Chu. Uh, Teresa Chu, Sarah Colbert, Cameron Duplessis, and uh, Menegvi Ebden. Ebden.
Okay. Uh, Lucy Young, Frank Fonseca, Benjamin Fox, no, um, Rita Futamura. That's it for this group. Okay, uh, Raman Gill, Josh Gray, Juan Henner, and Mackenzie Herb. Okay, uh, Kamal Kang, no. Uh, Saswati Kaur, okay. And uh, Aislinn Keen, just two for this one. We have to clap extra loud. Okay, uh, Annie Kam Hong and Tori Kroon. Again, just two, so extra effort. Okay, Alexa Labanka. Wan Yi Lam, and there's no one else standing there. Okay. <laughs> so I believe now we're going to go to our next set of coders, please. Thank you, coders. Okay, Chen Yu Lu, no, uh, Zilong Lu, have I missed somebody? Oh, he was on the last group, sorry. You were there. All right, so let's, we know what we're doing here. All right, it's not, it's Jing Li, for God's sakes. All right. How are we gonna do this one now? Uh, so Chen Yu Lu and Zilong Lu and Yang Lu. And are we gonna be able to fit Alec McCandle? All right. We'll find it, that's exactly. Wow, and there's the award for the best cheer in the back there. Well done, we'll need you for what about data blitzes. Okay, um, where are we up to? So Christabel McLean, Amber McLaughlin, and Tin Nguyen. Three for this group. All right, Grace Pepler and Matthew Prelberg. Just two for this one. Okay. 
Okay, Maggie Chin. Anupriya Ramamorthy. Meredith Ramba. And we'll just wait for them to come down. Paula, right? No? Okay, good. Uh, Laura Rosenberg. There we are. Rachel Sadonovic. Sadovnik. Uh, Zishan. No? And uh, that's it for this one. Lyra Chu, Adriana Sistig, and Han Noel Song. Okay, Subhasri Sridhar, uh, Ramja Shritharan, almost got there, and Stephanie Tang. All right, two more groups to go. Alexander Tillens, Henry Weith, and Jacqueline Willis. Okay, um, I think we need to change quotas. So thank you very much, quotas. All right. And bringing us home. So Kion Winston? Nope. Jake Wright? And Leah Yim. All right, so please, coaches, please stay. Please join me in uh, congratulating all of the matriculating biomedical science and neuroscience PhD students. Congratulations. <laughs> it's now time to call on stage the medical scientist uh, training program students who will also be starting their research. Dr. Talia Swartz, Associate Dean for MD-PhD Education, with the names of the MD-PhD candidates. Dr. Swartz, please come forward. Thank you, Dr. Filizola. So we're very excited to invite the MD-PhD candidates, and we'll call four at a time and ask for you to hold your applause until the four have been coded. So, Gerald Catlett. Winnie Chen, Khadija Crawford, Jeremy Fisher,
Jake Herb, Joy Jang, Audrey Lee. Jesse Mangold, Sarah Weitzman. And that concludes our MSCP students. Congratulations to all of our MSCP students starting their PhD journey. This year we are also excited to have joining us our uh, doctoral students in clinical research program. Dr. Janice Gabrilov, director of the clinical research education program, will read the names of the students. Dr. Gabrilov. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dean Martizola. Um, it's really a pleasure to be with all of you uh, today. I'll be introducing four of our eight first year PhD in clinical research students who are able to be with us today. Matali Mehta, Jasmine Modassi, Elizabeth Stidham, and Weijia Wang. Thank you very much. Thank you, the decoders. Thank you. And now I have the pleasure to present Dr. Basil Hans, Senior Associate Dean for a Postdoctoral in Student Affairs and Associate Dean of Wellness to administer the PhD oath followed by the faculty pledge. Dr. Hans, please come forward. Thank you, Marta. Um, I think before I start, this would be a great time uh, for all of those who received their lab coat today to stand up and uh, show your gratitude and appreciation to all of those, your family, your loved ones, your parents, uh, who helped you get to this really important milestone. So thank you to all of those who supported our students. Great, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to add my congratulations to those students who matriculated to our PhD and MD-PhD programs uh, in 2022. I ask you now to again stand up, sorry, I shouldn't have allowed you to sit, um, so that we can recite our PhD oath. Before I start reading the oath, uh, if I could also get all of the PhD candidates and PhD in, PhDs in the audience and any of those seated on stage with me uh, to also rise so we can all dedicate and rededicate our commitment to our profession. The oath is on page eight of the program and it's also uh, on the screen here. Okay, with my doctor of philosophy, I will willingly pledge to uphold the highest level of integrity, professionalism, scholarship, and honor. I will conduct my research and professional endeavors with honesty and objectivity. I will apply the highest standards of rigor and respect for the generation and application of knowledge and fully acknowledge the contributions of others. I will not allow financial gain or ambition to cloud my judgment or decision making nor cause harm to society or subjects of research. I will embark on the furthering of knowledge through respectful interaction and collaboration with my colleagues and community without prejudice or exclusion. I will be a role model and use my skills to inspire, mentor, 
and empower future generations, instilling in them the highest principles of ethical behavior. As witnessed by all present today, and in the tradition of graduates before me, I do affirm to uphold these guiding principles. Thank you, you may be seated. And now I ask all faculty members of the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai to stand and join me in the faculty pledge, which can be found on page nine of your booklet and on the screen. As teachers and mentors for our students, we pledge to maintain the highest professional standards in all of our interactions with students, patients, colleagues, and staff. We pledge our utmost effort to ensure that all components of the educational program for students will be of the highest quality. We'll respect all students as individuals without regard to gender, race, national origin, religion, or sexual orientation. We will not tolerate anyone who manifests disrespect or who expresses biased attitudes towards any student. We will not tolerate any abuse or exploitation of students. In an effort to nurture professional development, we pledge that students will have adequate time for reflection as well as personal and family obligations. Nurturing both the intellectual and professional development of our students, we will celebrate achievements of academic excellence and demonstration of the highest virtues of our profession. I would like to thank now the Graduate School of Biomedical Sciences staff for their assistance today, and again, the Montana Alumni Association for their ongoing support. In particular, I would like to recognize the following individuals, Brett Gano, Senior Associate Dean for Graduate School Administration and his team, Matt Cipriano, Jeff Kroll, and Sarah Bryant. Without their dedication and hard work, the ceremony would not have been possible. So can we please give them a round of applause? All present are invited to attend the reception in the Aaron Hall courtyard across the street. Please remain seated until those on stage have exited the auditorium. I'll ask the 2022 matriculating PhD and MD PhD classes to remain seated for group photos after the auditorium has emptied. The lab photo ceremony of the Graduate School of Biomedical Sciences at Mount Sinai is now concluded. Thank you and congratulations. Thank you. 